Okay, the story that Chaz is going to tell us is Catawba, Island, or Peninsula. So you've heard that question a lot of times. Hopefully you're going to walk away tonight with an answer. That's it. Chaz, take it away. Thank you. I'm going to try to speak as loud as I can, but if, if I get low and some of you in the back can't hear me, please shout at me and I'll speak up. Uh, a little background, me as far as historic things go, I've had an affinity for local history since I was a young child. Stems from my grandfather. My mother's a genealogist of the area. And, but I got with the Mu Ottawa County Museum about 10 years ago and I've really delved into things. This Catawba presentation kind of stems from my research on the Portage River. People, one of the most common things we get at the museum is people asking about rerouting the Portage River. The, and there's a lot of misconceptions about that. They think it was rerouted from Catawba. They think it was rerouted from west side of Catawba, even from Lakeshore Drive. So I sat about to verify what is wrong and what's right. And as in turn, this focused on the geology of the area. And since the Portage River did pass by Catawba at one point in time, I learned a lot about Catawba in this. So I've tried to modify this. I don't get into the Port Clinton aspect of the Portage River. I'm kind of keeping this with Catawba. And I've, like I say, I've modified it to address Catawba specifically. Uh, I'm not a geologist, so I'm presenting this kind of in layman's terms that I hope most people understand it because it's the way I understand it. Um, if you have any questions throughout it, please shout them out at the time as opposed to maybe having to backtrack for them. If I just holler them out to me and I'll try to answer them. Um, so obviously, is it an island or is it a peninsula? So I, here's the de definitions of an island. And most, mostly we know an island is surrounded by water, but there is some variance on this. Uh, small islands that are around land are, are called different names. Uh, an island in a river, which I'm not sure how you pronounce those names, Iode or Eight or something, uh, or a home, there's groupings of islands, like an archipelago the Philippines or the Hawaii, and actually these islands here are archipelagos because they're a grouping of islands. Um, this one, these should be colored, but they're not quite showing up that way. Uh, an island may be described as such with an artificial land bridge, such as the causeway down on Route 53. That does not disqualify this as an island. Uh, some places retain the island name for historical reasons, um, even though they're connected by a land bridge, such as Johnson Island. It's still called an island even though it has the causeway over to it. And not really relative to this, islands that are actually cut off are not considered real islands. If they build a canal, like the, I guess there's a shipping canal in New York that falls into that category. So based on these things, I would say yes, Catawba is an island, but I'm assuming you want more detail than that. Than that. <laughs> I'm going to cover basically four main areas. Uh, first, building the land. How did this land get here? Because at one time, every, this was all underwater. Uh, and these are mountain building events. An orogeny is a mountain building event. And then changing the land. We all know about the Ice Age uh, and the glaciers. Most of the glaciers I'm not going to worry about except for the last one, the Wisconsin Glacier. Because that was the last glacier here that left and it left behind what we have. Then there was the glacial lakes as the glaciers moved out of this area. But again, they don't bear much significance on this because this area was entirely underwater during them. It wasn't until the last glacial lake, the result of all this, Lake Lundy, was when Catawba began to poke out of the water. Marblehead as well, South Bass, 
Uh, and there was sub uh, lakes too that were part of Lake Lundy. Uh, I'll touch on those. And then about 4,000 years ago, modern Lake Erie, as we know it, became. So and as between 4,000 years ago and 400 years ago, there's not a whole lot of detail as to what has happened in this area because it hasn't changed much in that time, but I will touch on some of that. Here's what we have today, and I'm trying to point out some of the points that people think it's an island or think it's not. From, from ground level, it's hard to imagine that it's not connected to the peninsula, but there is a lot of water openings. Uh, there's a few, two natural land bridges, and that's the East Harbor beach line there. What that is, that's a beach line that was formed on an ancient glacial moraine. A glacial moraine is debris that is shoved up by the glaciers, and when the glacier re retreats, that debris is left behind. So the East Harbor Beach is built up on that moraine. Uh, the other natural one is Sand Road, and that is formed by a process called littoral drift in the a water current process, uh, also called longshore drift, and I'll touch on that a little bit later. On the East Harbor side, we have two openings. Those are man-made, and they've been there for a long time. I don't know if these were put in where a natural outlets want it to be or if man just put them there. But they've been maintained for two, three hundred years. So they allow water to come in here. I got a question. Sure. You said there was two, um, like in West Harbor, you got the Jim Beach. Well, yeah. But then the other one is man-made as far as I know that comes into West Harbor. Well, there's, there's actually probably two or three right in this, up by the Jim Beach area. Uh, there's a couple going out there, but you know that's all been modified in the last hundred years or something like that. Is that what you're trying to? No, that used to be the only inlet that I knew of in the West Harbor until the Army Corps of Engineers put in the other big one because the backup and traffic to the on the store. Well, yeah, well this one over here near near Lakeside, um, but the river went that way at one time, so that's kind of why I'm addressing it here. Um, and of course, West Harbor comes on down here. And as, as I mentioned, the causeway at 53 does not disqualify it. So it's kind of, I kind of ignore it throughout this. But the harbor came on over here, and there was an outlet right here down near where the Sand Road Fork is. And I will explain some of that later. Right now, Sand Road, of course, is connected. And that's really the only natural connection to Catawba. There's a couple spots right here. Rock Ledge is right there. And there's a couple spots where some of this marsh area comes within about four or five hundred feet of the lake. So it's still pretty close. And this is the west end of West Harbor. That channel used to come through there and it went out of right about here. I don't know if this little canal is a remnant of that channel or if it's something that was done later. The Sand Road Fork is right there. Christie Chapel is over here. And I'll touch on where they drained this. So they must have built a dam at some time, but I'm not sure where that's at. This is fairly new information to me. Moving a little eastward, You've got Rock Ledge right there. This is the real edge of the island, right there around Rock Ledge and over to, I think that's called Harbor's End, I believe that's called now. This is the one channel that comes up right there, and I'm not sure right offhand where that's located. You can see it as you drive down Sand Road, but it's got trees and stuff around it. This is a little bit past the golf course, but I'm not sure if this is there's got to be some water connection because there's that land bridge over there which I believe was built in the 60s when Tommy Thompson had Enchanted Forest and I think he built that as a western entrance over to Enchanted Forest but now it's used to get to the condos and things right there. 
Moving it a little farther east, I've because this has been East Harbor has been closed off to this for a long, long, long time. So I've kind of just disregarded it. The other water channel, it's very narrow, comes up around Muggy Road over here. Very narrow, goes up here. And there was a bridge right here at one time. Uh, I have never seen it, and I guess the abutments and the pilings are still there, but I've never actually been out there. It shows up on maps, which I will show later. But it went across there over to Buck Road, East Harbor, and I have to wonder how the area would have developed if that bridge had been maintained. This, whoops, this moves out, darn it, into the harbors a little bit, and this shows the outlets up by Jim Beach. So there's the narrow little pass through there. So the whole western side of Catawba is really open water, albeit narrow, and if had not been the, for the intervention of man, who knows that this might have connected to Danbury over here. But we'll, we'll never know that because man has modified it through all the years. So you think Lost Lake is all natural? Lost Lake, which is, I'm not sure where that's... That's what they would call it, I guess. Yeah, where Thompson oh. had the part of the... Oh, Enchanted Forest. Enchanted yeah. Forest. Um, yeah, Enchanted Forest was right in here. No, to the right. Off West Harbor. No, the body of water to the right. No, Enchanted Forest was right here. No, I'm talking about the body of water. This over the West Harbor? Is that what they call it? Yeah, yeah that's West Harbor. I didn't know I didn't know that was West Harbor. You just yeah. yeah West Harbor comes... I thought it was part of East Harbor, but then I remember you're right. There's a dinghy. I take your dinghy down through the... Yeah, well, about. West Harbor actually comes right up, up to Christie Chapel Road yeah. and, and beyond, really. So how did it get here? Uh, I'm going back way back into time. A, mil, a billion plus years ago, actually I think it's 1.2. Uh, the solid core of North America is called the North American Creighton, and geologists have dubbed this Laurentia. Now, this was actually built together from smaller pieces, but that's going way too far back. And the outer portion of the U.S. was not here. It just didn't exist. And much of the edge of this was continental shelf and would have been underwater anyways. So the exposed land, and what I'm gathering is this was just raw rock. There was no foliage and animals or anything like that on it. But it actually sat on its side. Uh, the, the Great Lakes region is right about where the arrow is. About a billion years ago, it collided with the southern or the northern portion of South America, which the geologists have dubbed Amazonia. And this happened down here at the South Pole almost. This is Laurentia, North America, and our area right here is called the Grenville Province. And I'm assuming, I haven't actually read it, but I'm assuming this map illustrates that it was ice covered. Don't know, I can't confirm that. So relative to the modern North America, what that did was produce the Grenville Mountains. This, the, the collision of the continents shoved up these and they actually stretch down into South America. This is what brought our land out of the water. And the Grenville Mountains lasted for a billion to 500 million years ago. This is where they were located in Ohio, which you see going up there. As these have eroded, they are now what's called the basement rock. Not the bedrock, like the outcrops we see here, that's bedrock. The basement rock is even lower. But that's the runoff from the Grenville Mountains. These were Himalayan-sized mountains, if you can imagine that running through this area. As they eroded away over the years, like I say, they became the basement rock. A remnant of this is what's called the Cincinnati Arch, which branches off here, goes this way, and we live on a branch called the Finley Arch. And it goes up 
in the canon of the Algonquin Arch. Now, this isn't quite what you would think. It's not, a, it's not an arch in the land. It's, a, it's an arch down in the bedrock of it. Uh, it's, all, it's been scoured away. And a lot of this has been scoured away by the glaciers, which I will get to. The continents had separated a little bit. Laurentia is over here. It's getting equatorial. It's going to become tropical a little bit. But it's on a collision course. This supercontinent called Gondwana is moving northward. And you've got two lines of um, volcanic islands right here. Not unlike Hawaii, but on a much larger scale. This is going to collide with northern Africa. Africa is going to hit, it's going to shove these volcanoes into North America. And this produces the Taconic Mountains. This is the second, this is part of the Appalachian orogeny. Uh, Appalachian orogeny was in three stages. This is the first stage. And as you see, the sediment from these mountains ran into this, they produced a sea in here, the Tippecanoe Sea. And it's the sediment from these mountains, which is now the Silurian limestone. That's the rocky outcrops you see here on Catawba. You know, it's been compressed to rocks. So the, the, the bedrock that you see here in Catawba came from these mountains. They went over the Grenfell Mountains, which were by that time pretty flat. And this shows you the difference. The Appalachian orogeny began about 500 million years ago. And you had two lines of volcanic islands, Africa, North America. The first line hit 500 mi million years ago. The second line hit the Arcadian Mountains about 400 million years ago. About 300 million years ago, it actually, we actually collided with Africa. And that produced the, the Appalachian Mountains that we know today. Uh, they've been eroded away, of course. But that's how they got here. And so basically, eastern North America was built up by this time. This gives you some idea. This is the second stage, the Arcadian Mountains. And it's, there's the Cincinnati Arch, and the, the Tippecanoe Sea is in here. And like the fossils that you find, notably Brown Marblehead Lighthouse, those fossils, those creatures lived in this sea. And it was there for millions of years. This gives you some idea. This is the apex of the Cincinnati Arch, West, West Sister Island. And you can see by the angle how the bedrock has been shoved up. Catawba's here, Marblehead's here. Marblehead was an island at one time. Th these are terms geologists use for the names of the, of the bedrock and stuff, kind of irrelevant here. But the angle gives you some idea. And this gives you some idea of the slope of what, these, what the land was like here at the time before it's all erode, eroded away. All this occurred with the last major supercontinent, Pangaea, uh, which was about 300 to 200 million years ago. But the Mid-Atlantic Ridge began to separate the continents. It's, the vol it's a line of volcanoes that runs down the center of the Atlantic. And the continents have since moved apart, and they are still doing so today. About three million years ago, North America was in an, its present location, and fairly recognizable. You had some coastal buildup yet to be done, and of course you don't see the Great Lakes there. They weren't formed yet. And these are, this is an idea of the bedrock. This is the oldest. This is the Silurian limestone, that, which comes up through Catawba. This is early Devonian, which came from the second mountain uh, building stage, and late Devonian. And this comes into the Mississippian and Pennsylvanian, which are not really relevant here. We're lo looking at these. And if you zoom in, this was laid down about 500 million years ago, about 400, about 300. One noticeable little point right here is this. That's the, mid, the early Devonian. That's East Harbor Park. That's the main section of the park, not the beach. And if you're like at the front shelter house at East Harbor, 
you'll notice you can tell a lot of, behind it there's been a lot of water going through there at some time in the past what that suggests to me and again i'm not a geologist but this suggests to me that the river went this way initially and when this sediment was laid down it pushed the river northward to west harbor or perhaps vice versa it depends because this sediment goes under the lake too it goes under the water this is just a picture to kind of give you a basis this is lakeside looking east or looking west down the portage river lakeshore drive is right there port clinton's there and you come up to west harbor here middle harbor and east harbor so you can tell the river event originally went through here so how did the lakes get there why were there no great lakes well mountains build rivers as these mountains eroded rainfall uh they probably had snow caps a lot of things the runoff will produce rivers and this is something you don't hear a lot about when it comes to the glaciers everyone says the glaciers formed the great lakes and they had a considerable influence but what the glaciers did was follow the path of least resistance through these ancient river valleys and these river valleys were deep running through mountains and you'll notice down here what looks like our peninsula it's it's kind of deformed this was put together by a geologist in 1896 named Joseph Spencer uh, Euro European explorers came started coming here in the late 1500s early 1600s and there was always exploration study of the geology of this area but by the 1800s it was scattered all over the place so Spencer put it all together and he published it in the July 1896 issue of Popular Science it was a whole large article and this is one of the maps he presented the this was the Laurentian River system the main river ran through here and on out the St. Lawrence River uh, this one ran across the Huronian River ran across Michigan Lake Michigan wasn't there but in Lake Erie it was the Aragon River which didn't Niagara Falls it didn't cross Niagara Falls it crossed far west of it and came out in Hamilton Ontario today Hamilton Bay is a remnant of this river and you see it had several tributaries here zooming in on our area this is I'm supposing this is showing the Sandusky River not the Portage this is surely the Maumee and the Detroit River now he's illustrating the lake but the lake wasn't there he's just tr using that to give you a perspective as to where these rivers were this would be sort of what it looked like just the river system here and then there were other rivers throughout the area but they're irrelevant here went out the st lawrence river what what he's trying to illustrate he's using this is lake ontario but the same would hold true for lake erie this is the ancient riverbed that's down there and it's still out there now this is the sediment on top and i'm assuming this is the water level and i'm not quite sure what he's referring to with this perhaps different levels of land or something because the water certainly was always flat this is another map that i have attributed to spencer but i'm not certain maybe someone just copied him and you'll see it shows a little bit of the peninsula there and zooming in i've colorized it to help show you this is clearly the marblehead peninsula sandusky river coming out there portage river coming out there and sandusky bay is really part of, it was once the, the river and you can see these extended and met somewhere south of Pelee island which followed on out to meet the Aragon out here probably somewhere around lorraine maybe something like that then came the glaciers and the farthest the glaciers came was down here but like I say, I'm only going to focus on the Wisconsin Glacier, which only reached this far. It was the last one, because came, they came and went. And the glaciation in Ohio looked about like this. And the glaciers came this way. The reason this wasn't glaciated was 
primarily because of this. It's a hard rock ridge that comes down from New York and curves down almost towards Columbus. The glaciers had a hard time getting over it. Plus, they followed the angle of the, of the river, which is now the angle of the lake, and they came down from the north here, so they're going to shove over that way. By about 20, 15,000 years ago, the glaciers began to retreat. And they, as they melted, their, their moraines were over here. The, the, the debris they shoved ahead was left behind, and that formed the glacial lakes. This is the first glacial lake, Lake Maumee. It emptied out either two ways, and I'll show that later. This is what it would have looked like. We'd, we'd been under 300 feet of water at this time. And of course, these land features would not have been there. This is just overlaying over a current map. Now, this is tough to see because it's not colorized, but this is Lake Maumee. Here's a better one. This is Lake Maumee, and you see Catawba, Port Clinton over here, Toledo's there. Originally, there were three stages of this. The highest stage went into Indiana, and it drained out the Wabash River. Lower stages, it went around the thumb of Michigan and out Chicago. Both of these went to the Mississippi River and helped make the Mississippi River. How many millions of years ago was that, Lake Maumee? Uh, about 500, let's see, no, about, about 14, 15,000 years ago. Somewhere in that part. A lot of these figures that I use are kind of general. Somewhere between 20, 15, 14,000 years ago. Because I've also found information that's not precise. One, one source will say this many years, one source will say that many years. So I've kind of tried to use a general term. Because we're talking so long ago, a thousand either way kind of doesn't matter. <laughs> So that's Lake Maumee. This, I won't touch on this much. This is Lake Whittlesey, one of the other great lakes. As you see, it's still almost reaching Indiana. It's gotten a little wider up on the northeast. And this, this did drain around Michigan and down to the Mississippi that way. This is Lake Warren. It's opening up a little more towards the east. Catawba's right here. On a lot of these, you'll see a little red arrow. That's generally pointing to, to this area. This also opened around, drained around there. This was the last major glacial lake, and this is the one we're interested in, Lake Lundy. It was pretty much covered the entire Erie Basin. And by this time, the basins had been scoured out. The, the glaciers widened the, the river valleys and scoured them out. This one drained eastward over into the Hudson River and out to the Atlantic that way. Early Lake Michigan, or yeah, Lake Michigan was still draining that way because this was, cl this was closed off by the glaciers. So this is an idea of what Lake Lundy was like over a current satellite image. And what the arrows indicate, or basically for me, I followed this ridge all the way around. And the Portage River was here at that time, but the mouth of the Portage would have been back by Sugar Creek, which is west of Oak Harbor. The mouth of the Portage, and if you get to that area, you can tell just by all the, the water channels running through there, you can tell that's where it was. But you'll see the islands are beginning to pop out. Lundy was 600 to 620 feet deep. So we're talking 50 feet deep, deeper than what the lake is now. But the islands began to poke out. A little closer, you can see Marblehead and a little string through there. Some of Kelly's, some of South Bass, and bits and pieces of Catawba are poking out. A different view of the same thing. This gives you a little better idea uh, of what's, or there's a little bit of something here, and I'm not sure exactly what that area is. As you're driving down 
163 East Harbor Road. If you look to the south, you'll see, you can see the land rise over there. It's, it's a good 10, 15 feet higher than, than the road. This zooms in a little bit closer on Catawba. This is not meant to be water. I just haven't filled the, the land in because my focus is up here. So we're talking about the cliffs around the valley, Sugar Rock, and I think this is around Barnum Road, and of course Rock Ledge. And then of course Marblehead was, was an island. Actually the Marblehead would have been an island before Catawba because it's higher, it's a few feet higher than Catawba. These are the ancient beach ridges from all the gla glacial lakes. And most of these are irrelevant to this, but I'll zoom in on Catawba. And these are beach ridges here in Catawba. Now, I've driven by and kind of looked, but I've never actually gotten out and studied them, so I'm not sure. This is around, coming around West Harbor, down around Muggy Road and that. There's a couple here in Danbury, which I haven't looked at. But these are actually at sub-stages of Lake Lundy, which is Lake Elkton and Lake Grasmere. Um, I don't think there's actually sand there. I don't know. Someone might know. But as far as beach, actual sand, this is a little off topic, sand beach ridges, the best you can find is up in oak openings. There are still sand dunes up there from these ancient lakes. And touch a little bit on the Black Swamp. After all these lakes, this is what we were left, the mucky bottom of these lakes, and which was there until the 1850s, but not really relevant to Catawba. Catawba was too high, and most of the Mar Marblehead Peninsula was too high. This is a graphic showing you the lakes. The redder ones don't mean anything, really, to us here. The highest was 812, until we get down here to Lake Lundy, which was 600 to si 620 feet. These are the ones where Catawba is going to be popping out of the water. This is a slightly different graphic of the same thing, and it shows you how the lake levels fluctuated between the different glacial lakes. They were up and down. They didn't just, the glaciers didn't just leave. They came back and left over thousands of year times. And this is what we have left in the area. These are the beach ridges. Uh, this is a topographical map of the beach ridges. And the Lundy one must not have stayed very long because the Lundy Ridge Beach Ridge is fairly undefined, unlike these other ones. Anyways, about nine, ten thousand years ago, the glaciers opened up the St. Lawrence River. This was still draining across there, and for a while Lake Huron actually drained across here. But what ended up happening it drained Lake Erie almost to nothing. And within this time, I'm assuming foliage, animals, even native inhabitants probably lived in what is now Lake Erie. So we had something like this. The glaciers had moved northward. Uh, Lake Ontario was draining. This little bit in the eastern basin of Lake Erie, and it actually had a name called Lake Dana. And it would qualify as a glacial lake, but these still hadn't filled yet. These were still draining around that way. And the reason they drained, Lake Erie drained, was because the glaciers pushed the land down. The glaciers were even miles thick, hundreds of feet thick, miles thick. And they were thicker farther to the north. If you see up here, it compressed at 90 meters, which, what, that's about 300 feet so everything drained that way once the St. Lawrence River was open. But the glacial rebound called isostatic iso rebound, but crustal rebound, what, there are a lot of names for it. it. The land began to rise and is still doing so today, but at a very, very slow rate. But here's what the Great, La the Great Lakes looked like at one time. They were basically empty once the glaciers left. So, like I said, there would have been, this was for thousands of years, there would have been trees, foliage and stuff in there. They begin to fill. As the land begins to rise to the north, 
the lakes begin to fill. And this is all from rainwater and probably some ground seepage from the glaciers that were still present farther north. But most of it came from rainwater. This is kind of what our area would have looked like. Again, these features would not have been there. That was a result of Lake Erie, but I'm using a current map. What would be the time frame of that? Uh, that right there, uh, I would say 8,000 8, years ago, 7,000 years ago, somewhere in that ballpark. Uh, they're filling a little bit more, but you see our area is not quite full yet. It would look something like that. There would still be a land bridge over to uh, Canada. And this is called the Pele Lorraine Ridge. It's, a, it's an underwater moraine that would probably have been a land bridge and would certainly have connected at some time over here to Lorraine. It runs from Pele Island, Pele Point over here. And it divides the Central Basin from the Sandusky Basin. Lake Erie was the first one to fill. It is the oldest of the Great Lakes. The other ones still have a little bit, even Lake Ontario, because it's deeper than Lake Erie. These are massive compared to Lake Erie, so they had a, they had a lot to fill. Finally, about 4,000 years ago, what we call Lake Erie today uh, had is formed. All the good Great Lakes were pretty much as they are today. Uh, it was emptying out the Niagara River. And from what I understand, when the Great Lakes, when they first drained, there was a flood of water across the Niagara. And that's part of what formed the Niagara Gorge. If any of you have been up to Niagara Falls, the gorge is really deep and at going up to Ontario. But these are the ancient riverbeds that are in, out in Lake Erie. And what I'm assuming is, it sh you see it shows the portage coming up here, bends past the islands until it meets the Detroit River up here. These ancient riverbeds are out there. What I'm figuring, because I haven't found real clarification, that when the portage came out here, as the glaciers came in and out, they shoved it westward to the other side of Catawba. Here's a... Uh, an animation showing how the lake filled when it first filled and where the deeper portions are. Sandusky Basin filled first. We're all still land down in here. It slows down a little bit once it gets to the edges. And this is using modern bath bathymetry of the lake. So who knows what it really looked It would have been similar, but don't know exactly what it's like. You see, Sandusky Bay is the last to fill, and that was about the same time the harbors filled. Yeah, but what that illustration doesn't show is it kept filling a little bit more. When Lake Erie first filled, it was 10 to 15 feet deeper than what it is now. It's 573 feet now above sea level, there's 580 feet. So it would have gone, Lake Erie was originally about 585 feet, which would have been that. The mouth of the portage would have been back by Oak Harbor, somewhere there. So Catawba was definitely an island at that time. And from what I understand, the sand ridges of Sand Road and East Harbor, they were built with modern Lake Erie, so they probably were not there, were not above the water yet. It wasn't until Lake Erie drained back to its current level that they turned up above the water. This is the flow of Lake Erie's waters, and you would think it all flows eastward, but it doesn't necessarily. Because of the land features and the underwater features, it flows different ways, and looking at our area, you see it actually flows southward off of Pelee, and it hits the islands in Catawba and rushes back towards Port Clinton. That's what's formed Sand Road. East Harbor is formed by the, the flow this way, as well as Bay Point and Cedar Point was created by that, all on an 
ancient moraine. This is, a, I think it's about 2006. This is Sand Road. And I'm not sure why it looks so dirty, but you see the, the flow coming out here. The portage looks dirty too, so I'm not really sure why that is. But it gives you an illustration. That's how Sand Road formed. A lot of people, like I said, people come to the museum and think they rerouted the Portage River from Catawba. They didn't. It was, in, it was well into Port Clinton for thousands of years before they did that. And this map illustrates that. 1778 is this map. You see the Portage is clearly in Port Clinton. And this is also the earliest map that I found that illustrates the harbors. Things are still a little inaccurate, but not too bad. But I wanted to point that out. If anyone ever tells you that they moved the Portage River from Catawba, that didn't happen. N nature did that thousands of years ago. This, and I'm going to step into Port Clinton a little bit here. Uh, the Army Corps, the only thing of the Portage River that the Army Corps did was change the mouth. They built the piers in Port Clinton. This is an 1868 map, and they began that in 1868 of... Army, it's an Army Corps map showing the river path, wanting to go out there at an angle, whereas now the piers run almost northward. Another Army Corps map showing an angling out here. Likewise here. They have built the West Pier here and part of the East Pier. And you see the river is still wanting to take its natural path. That corresponds with this path right here. So like I said, the, the river was in Port Clinton long before the white man ever came to this area. And uh, one, one last touch of Port Clinton, this is 1883. The piers had been built by this time. This is Perry Street looking east. This is Madison, Jefferson, and Fulton Streets way down there. Zooming in, again Madison, and I like these little shadowy figures. This must have been a long exposure. Uh, this is the Lake Hotel, which stood where Wendy's parking lot is now. So this is Jefferson Street right here. This is water. The sidewalk, this tree which stood there until the 1980s. The sidewalk now runs here. The road, Perry Street, now runs here. So up until this time, Perry Street did not go eastward past Jefferson Street. Even though it shows on old maps, it, it wasn't there. You can see the wagon tracks running on the shoreline along there. This eventually built up to what we have today. But that's all I'm going to touch on Port Clinton. My theory is that the river started right here. And like I say, if you go down 163 and you look to the south, you'll see the land is a lot higher. I think the river was actually either higher or wider and it may have been back in the early days with a lot of runoff from the mountains. But I think it's moved, been shoved over here, a changed path. And if you look at a topography map of Catawba, I see possibility that it actually there's valleys that run through Catawba. Maybe it spent a little bit of time there, but I found no confirmation on that. Maybe it even cut Sugar Rock off from the island. Someone else suggested to me that Sugar Rock broke off, which could be. But anyways, it ended up far on the west side of Catawba. And that kind of leaves us out of the Portage River. This is West Catawba Road. These are those hills that when you were a kid, when you went down, it tickled your tummy going down. Well, those would be the shorelines of probably the river when it was wider, or West Harbor was wider at that time and deeper as well. So here we have modern Lake Erie, as we all know it. And what most people don't know, this is actually called Portage Bay. They've stopped using that name years ago. I don't know why, but it shows up on old maps. And let me jump into the far, far future. We were talking thousands of years. This is the Niagara Escarpment. This is what the Niagara River is cutting through, and this is what the walls of the G Niagara Gorge are. Well, within a thousand year, a few, several thousands of years, the Niagara River is going to cut back to Lake Erie. Niagara Falls are going to cut back. They're cutting back, what, three feet a year, I think, something like that, 
eventually they're going to get back to Lake Erie. And what's going to happen then, Lake Erie and all the upper Great Lakes are going to drain. Given enough time, enough erosion, the rivers in here will return. The, the lake basin will erode down to those rivers again. But I don't think any of us are going to live long enough to have to worry, worry about any of that. But I just want to touch on the future a little bit there. Now I'm into what I'd like to call the present time, modern time. The, er the earliest explorers, European explorers, came here 1500s. They came to America like Columbus came in 1400s. But to the Great Lakes region, the earliest explorers came in the 1500s, 1600s. And they began to map the area. And I don't know if you remember from school, a French explorer named Sa Samuel de Champlain. This was one of his maps. Yeah, it's 1634. And it shows Lake Michigan, Lake Huron, I guess that's supposed to be Superior, Lake Ontario, and I'm guessing this is supposed to be Lake Erie, whatever. Perhaps that's Pelee Island, I don't know. It doesn't, they don't even really label it. So the, these early maps are inaccurate, and it's hard to tell what happened from the time Lake Erie filled to today to about 400 years ago. It's hard to really determine what has happened within that time period. This is the earliest map that I found, 1656, that shows the Portage and the Sandusky. And this is probably the peninsula, Catawba, Marblehead. Not labeled, but this is clearly the Maumee River, and that's clearly uh, the Detroit River. This one from 1723, Detroit River, Maumee, so I'm guessing this is perhaps Portage, Sandusky, maybe Huron River. But it shows the islands sitting in like a little cove or something, and no other islands throughout here. So it's really hard to tell from these old maps what Catawba looked like. Was it an island at that time? This one I'm showing the whole region because it's still skewed. And I realize their survey uh, technology was not good. I mean, Michigan is all bent over and stuff. Whoops. Zooming in, I'm guessing that's the Portage and that's the Sandusky River. So this must be the peninsula here because that's the Maumee, which is originally the, called the Miami River. Detroit River's up there. Uh, a smattering of islands there. <laughs> Completely inaccurate. This one, I guess that's supposed to be Sandusky Bay. So I'm assuming this would be a peninsula, but it doesn't show it in any way. And this would have to be the Maumee, so it doesn't even show the portage. Detroit River's up there, and the islands, it has it angling up towards the Detroit River, which we know that doesn't. They're east of the Detroit River. This one from 1762 has islands scattered throughout the lake, and they're only in the western basin. And I'm guessing, again, that's probably the Sandusky River, the Sandusky Bay, Miami, Maumee River. This is the earliest map I found that has a reasonable look of Catawba. And zooming in, you can tell, I don't know if they are qualifying that as the Portage or maybe the Toussaint River. But clearly you have the neck here, you have Catawba, Marblehead, Bay Point, Johnson's Island, the bay is showing there. Cedar Point over here, Kelly's up there. Still off, but it's getting close. This is an alternate version of that 1778 map I showed earlier. This one is the earliest I found that labels the Portage River, and the earliest I found that show the harbors. It's reasonably accurate all around. It's still, you, know, you know the shape isn't quite like that, but it's getting close. This map is way off, but I love this map. <laughs> I'll and you zoom in on it, the islands are just all over the place. This is the Maumee River. The Portage River is coming up here. Catawba's right here, and it says good limestone. Marblehead's here, and I like this, pyramids of rock. Uh, and of course, Sandusky Bay, which they call Little Lake. I, I, think just, I just think it's an attractive map, even though it's completely in, inaccurate. 
Ohio became a state in 1803. This is one of the earliest maps of Ohio. Zooming in on our area, now they still couldn't get this very right. They've got the peninsula bending up, the bay, the portage is like running all over the place here. I guess that's the two saint. And the western basin is just all out of whack. So again, I don't, it's hard to say what happened to Catawba as an island at this time, but the later maps will kind of give you an idea. Uh, we all know about the Firelands, where the people of Connecticut lost their homes to fire, and the government gave them uh, land in this area. It follows up Leitner Road and goes up, I think, West Catawba Road on up to the cliffs. And I th don't know if it included the other islands or not. <coughs> but zooming in, they're clearly, I don't think they meant strive for accuracy here, but they're still kind of recognizing this as just a part of the peninsula. Don't know. I, I, I think it just has to do with a lack of accuracy. A little later map, basic, basically the same thing, although they've got a large lump there, which I don't think was ever there. If you look at the bathymetry of the lake these days, it's pretty much Portage Bay is kind of like it always has been. This is the first map that I found that really is decently accurate. Uh, and it shows a little squiggle there for the harbor, but it still kind of recognizes it all as one peninsula. Same with this one, 1818, pretty much the same, one little squiggle, one whole peninsula. This one's like all out of whack. I don't know what they thought the peninsula looked like there. And someone observant might notice something about this map that I'll tell you about in the next one. Um, but the islands are all kind of still out of whack. I mean, I don't even know what happened to Pelee Island unless that's supposed to be it up there. But here's the next map, and someone's drawn over this. And really fairly irrelevant here, but it's a little sidebar. You might notice the mouth of the Maumee is in Monroe, Michigan. This is during the Toledo Wars, when the Michigan border was farther south. And, whoops, that map illustrates it too. Someone has drawn that on the map, and I don't know. And the color of the peninsula looks like it was either, it might have been Michigan, I don't, I don't really know, but I don't think the peninsula was part of that issue there. It was, they were after Toledo. This is really a decent map as far as accuracy, and you can see it's called Port, there's where it's called Portage Bay. But again, it's still pretty much showing it as peninsula. The river is pretty accurate, the, the islands are accurate, uh, but still, is this an island or not? This one, I don't think strive for accuracy, but I thought it was interesting because it shows boat lines going across here from the harbors, and even like, looks like from the cliffs or something over here, which I thought was interesting. Maybe that had to do with uh, some of the lime kilns and stuff that were out there. This map is really good. 1845 map, and I've colorized it so you can tell. This is the first map I found, and it looks hand drawn. This is the top part of Catawba, which should be up there. But you can clearly see the harbor coming all the way down here. But it's a little unclear what happens down here at the Sand Road Fork down there. Another 1845 map, not colorized, but it's showing the, pretty much the same thing. Another 1845 map, and it's showing the same thing. And I'm not sure what this little, it, it shows a fork there, but I don't, no of sand row. I don't think it had a fork at that time. It also shows a little bit of what looks like water inlets over here, so I'm not really sure exactly what's going on in this area. 1854, we're back to this, showing it as a whole peninsula. But this map is good. This is maps at the Library of Congress. And zooming in on our area, you see, actually, East Harbor is broken up into several pieces, and I'll explain why I think that is. But this is coming 
down here, all the way down. The reason I think this is like this, because in the late 1850s, we had a lot of rainfall and the lake levels rose. So that could explain this. Also, it was in the late 1850s, they were draining the Black Swamp. I would have to think that would have some impact, however minor, on the level of Lake Erie. But in the late 1850s, early 1860s, the lake level was a foot or two higher than what it normally is. And so I suspect that's why East Harbor is broken into different pieces and why this goes so far. But if you zoom in on that corner, right there in this little inset, you will see that canal that I referred to earlier goes out and it's got a little bridge across it right there. That bridge did exist there and that canal did go there. I've got a feeling it might have been man-made. I haven't found any reference whether it was nat natural or man-made or man-modified anyways. But Catawba is clearly completely surrounded by water at this time. And not that long ago, we're talking 150 years ago, and again, I think that little outlet, it, if you take that map and lay it over a map, a uh, satellite image now, that little outlet corresponds exactly with this. There's the Sand Road Fort Kroger's right here. So I would bet they left that in there in some way, shape, or form because it was already there. Uh, a few more maps. These show the harbor coming all the way down but it's hard to tell. Another one, the dates are all up in the corner. Harbor's coming all the way down here, and I'm imagining that bridge and that little channel was still there. This is one of the best maps. This is from the official Ottawa County Atlas of 1874. A lot of people may have seen it, Hardesty Atlas. It shows actually a couple little islands there, but zooming in, you can't quite tell what it's doing there. There's the Sand Road Fork right there. Can't quite tell if it's going to the lake or not, or is the channel just so small they don't illustrate it. But from the same atlas, this is Catawba. And that would imply to me that the channel was still there because they cut it off there. And what people might notice too, Sand Road was owned by the Lakeshore and Michigan Southern Railroad. The railroad first came through Port Clinton in 1852, and a storm, one of the bad storms in the late 1850s, in 1858, washed out the Bay Bridge, and the railroad used to cross by the river bridge in Port Clinton, right by Brands Marina, and uh, went out Lakeshore Drive. Well, the storm washed that out, they abandoned the railroad. In 1872, Oliver True rebuilt the railroad and I suspect they bought this land with the idea of sending a track out to the Catawba because you had Ottawa City out here which had hopes of being a you know a, a big little village or something which it ended up not being maybe that's why they abandoned it, the railroad but I would bet they had plans to build a railroad out there uh, not a whole lot showing here. Danbury shows West Harbor and the East Harbor still open. Like I said, this has been closed for a long time. So I disregard any East Harbor opening over here. So the one up by Jim Beach is the one that we really only focus on. This is from the same atlas, but this is a county map as opposed to a township. And it's showing the, the channel coming up here. And what you'll notice, oh, I for, forgot to mention on one of those 1845 maps, is the causeway is in here. If you go on CatawbaIslandTownship.com, they say the causeway was put in the 1890s. It's, cl it's clearly in here. And also, on one of those 1845 maps, it has something that looks like the causeway. I think the causeway was put in in the late 1830s, 1840s. It, didn't, it looks like it didn't connect to West Catawba here, but the causeway is clearly there. Uh, this is a bedrock map, or like sediment map, 
and it's showing the channel still coming over here. Channel still coming over here, the causeways in, the whole west side is still open. Same here, this almost looks like it's cutting off Catawba a little bit, don't know. This one's pretty inaccurate, but I found this interesting because it shows what looks like a channel coming from East Harbor. It shows West Harbor up here. I don't think they were striving for accuracy on this one. Even as late as it is and as good as maps had been by then. This map, the, the colorization of the map makes it hard to tell. But it's kind of isolating Catawba right here. I think that's a little inaccurate. They might have been exaggerating on it. Then we get to this. This was just presented to me about a week ago and someone heard I was doing this. This is an article from July 1897 and I'm not sure what newspaper it comes from. It's hard to read so I've transcribed it. But it talks about in a few months the dredging of West Harbor south of Catawba Island will be finished in the pumping station erected for purpose of freeing it from water. After everything is in readiness the pumps will start and water is cleared out over a thousand acres of land will be made available worth about ten dollars per acre. They would have had to build a dam. I, it doesn't, that's all it tells you. This actually raises more questions than it answers. But it goes on to say as soon as this, is, this improvement is completed, Catawba will cease to be an island and attach to the mainland by a peninsula. And will be a peninsula. Again, I just got this last week, but it gives me a time frame to kind of research, look in old newspapers and see what I can find about this. But I'm not really sure if this actually happened, and I'll explain it a little bit. But clearly, they were trying to reclaim some of the land there in, what, in the very west end of West Harbor. Now, I'll get there. Yeah. Well, I mentioned that. And the other interesting thing is, I go back a little bit, you indicated the sand bridge from Muggy Road along Route 53. When, when we put the entrance into the Marsh's Edge, next to Barnes Nursery, we started in, we took about a foot of clay off, and we hit sand. Really? <coughs> sand for the first hundred, probably the first hundred yards of the Really? <laughs> well, that, that might be that beach ridge that I was talking about. Uh, not relative to Catawba, but that reminds me, I do construction work. I do electrical, carpentry, and stuff. I used to do some work for J. Bo Sliman that owned the garden. And they had a garden restaurant in town, and they had the terrace out front. And like that picture where I showed you... Perry Street was just sand from there. He had some electrical, had some lights around the terrace out there. And he had electrical problem with him, but the main junction box was buried in the center of the terrace, and I had to dig down about two feet to get to it. I dug down about a foot, and there was sand there. So that was the shore, the old shoreline there. And uh, Jay Bo Simon told me that the whole terrace area actually had sand under it when they put that in like that. But yeah, probably the same thing you're talking about, you know, a little bit of sediment on top of these old beach ridges, you know. So anyways, I don't know if that happened. But this is going back to that channel. If they had done that, I'm talk I assume they're talking about the far west end. At first I thought, well, you're going to have to build a dam. Otherwise, the water is going to keep coming in. And I thought that might have been Christie Chapel Road, but Christie Chapel Road didn't cross at that time. So I thought maybe they built the dam in here or somewhere. But again, I only got that piece of information a week ago, and I haven't had time to really look into it. And even if they really even did it, there's also a, where Ken Gill Construction is right in here. There's that path across there. Maybe that was dammed. Because uh, here's 1900. It would be better explained if you call that dam a dike. Okay, yeah, that's and a good. It was built by a steam shovel, and it was the Catawba Island West Harbor.
Harvard Development Company. They stole stock. They did really? Festival. They packed them in the lawn. Do you know where that was? Yes, I do. I have the paperwork on it. Oh, that's wonderful. <laughs> they were bankrupt and in receivership most of the time. That would, that would be a better word. I, I like that word better than, than damn. They never did damn up uh, that riverbed. They a portion of it. At the same time, at, if you go up around the uh, past the Tucson towards Bono Curve, they had recovered thousands of acres up there, and they planted it into what we would call truck gardens. At the same time, they, they got together and developed this in the Catawba down there. Really? The harbor. See. Following the big development up towards Toledo at, or Maumee State Park. See, I'm hoping to find out these things once I look a little more into whatever that article is trying to tell me, because that was, that was news to me, and it kind of kind of gave a deciding point as to when Catawba was no longer an island, even though it still is. But now this is, this is three, three years after, and it's still showing the harbor coming right up to Sand Road. So I'm not certain exactly what was going on there. 1900, showing the harbor more as a marshy area, but it does have what looks like a channel coming up to about here. So I don't know if the dike was built across here or just uncertain just what's going on with it. This is looking a little more towards the harbors. Uh, this also seems to illustrate a channel running through here. Don't really know, but if you look close, it's showing a bridge across over to Buck Road. And I'm assuming that's about the time it went in. And this was not a land bridge, it was a bridge, you know, a, a structure with pilings and abutments, unlike the causeway, which is a land bridge. A little irrelevant here, but I like this map. It's very inaccurate. Look how massive Kelly's Island is. <laughs> the Portage River's coming out in Oak Harbor. And Lakeside looks like as much of a metropolis as Port Clinton and Danbury. And Danbury, you know, is down here. But it's showing a trolley car going out there. And the inner urban went through here for about 50 years. And so they must have had an idea to bring the, not only the railroad, but the inner urban out here. Never materialized. And that's the only thing I've seen of this. I thought I would include it in here. And I don't know the age of the map, but it must be around those years. <coughs> this is the first map that I've showed that definitively shows the bridge across there. And like I say, I'd have to wonder how this whole area would have developed had that, they maintained that bridge uh, and let the harbor kind of fill in or something. Because this doesn't show much of the harbor. It's just a line down through there, even though we know it was wider still at the time. This is a book that was published, first published in 1898. You can read it, Sketches and Stories of the Lake Erie Islands. But this is the 1913 edition to correspond with the celebration of Oliver Perry, 100 year celebration. And what it talks about, it talks, I don't know if this is fictional or if it's a true story, but it talks about a visitor who wants to go to Catawba. So he hops on a stagecoach and he's wondering, how are you gonna go to Catawba Island on a stagecoach? So the driver finally, he finally asks the driver, well, when do we get to the water? And he says, well, that water was way back there. And it talks about, had the stranger turned back a few miles over the route to a place where, it's hard for me to see, two main thoroughfares, the Sand Road and the Lakeshore Road, form a cross. My, my eyesight's not reading that real good. Or fork, he might have seen the narrow ditch with an unpretentious bridge thrown over it. Now this is 1913, what, uh, almost 20 years after supposedly it was drained. This ditch terminating at the lake is, the, is now, wow, I'm having trouble, is all that now makes Catawba an island. So there, that would imply that it's still surrounded by water. 
So I don't know. Again, I've got to look into this a little bit deeper. Uh, and it talks about how the ditch is old settlers remember it being very narrow between it and the mainland. This is a good book. There's, there's a modern copies of this. It's a really good book, uh, stories about all the islands in this area. Uh, looking, a little more map. Doesn't, doesn't show the harbor very well, but we know it's there. But it does show the bridge right there. As far as I can tell, that bridge was probably there until the 40s or 50s, maybe. I haven't found a definitive timeline on it. So we're getting into some modern pictures here. Sadly, I didn't have... The, most of these events occurred before photography. Some of the late 1800s, there was photography, obviously, but I just have not found any photos of the things in question. This is the old drive-in. And Christie Chapel Road is there, East Harbor Road, Sand Road over there. But you see how far the water still comes up there. This is 56, and the Sand Road, the fork is up there. This is East Harbor Road. And the, lo the most western remnant of the harbor was this pond behind that ranch house that was torn down. Uh, last year or something like that, the pond has been filled in. I'm not quite sure if this is showing sun reflection on the water or if it's like raw ground. I'm not really sure. Seems as though I remember water going up that far, but I don't know. It's, and it's hard to tell from this photo. But as it stands now, that is not the westernmost point of the left of the harbor. It's back a ways. This is looking at Catawba, 1957, and zooming in here, the little channel for West Harbor goes around here by Muggy Road, and we're pretty clear going on back. That's the causeway, but you see how close Harbor still is there. This is Rock Ledge, and so we're only talking a few, few hundred feet, four or five hundred feet across there. This is looking same year, looking a different perspective. Christie Chapel Road, Sand Road, 163, the old drive-in. The harbor's still coming up there pretty good, not quite to the fork now. And we're still pretty filled in up here around Rock Ledge. That old drive-in, where was that located? Um, where Dubert's, Dubert's okay. is yeah, now. Okay. Yeah, right there. And there's some storage units there, too, I think. Um, 1960, 1963, uh, this is beginning to fill in a little bit. I'll look closer at it. Th again, this is Rock Ledge. This is a true end of the island. And you can see this is getting a little more marshy by now. But there's still water in there. And I'm not quite sure. It looks like it's illustrating some... Some, some dikes or something going across there. I think this was before Tommy Thompson built that little causeway across there. That was probably later 60s, I think. Question. Those dunes that you're speaking of right now, those were the various beaches right. that were created by the first 14 lakes of Lake Erie, the different levels. And they extended almost a mile and a half out. No, that... that those are formed by littoral drift from the south flow. Oh, those are beach ridges. No, there was no beach ridge in this, in this area. <laughs> I mean, I, I, there's plenty of reference to that. Those, those are beach ridges. Well, they are, they are beach ridges. It's sand because it was... They're sand. They're sand. But it was for, not formed by the glacial lakes. It was formed by littoral drift off the west side of Catawba. Okay. That's not information that I learned. I, I could show you a dozen references to, to, to that. Uh, looking, looking towards the harbors, the little channels there. The outlet by Jim Beach is there. Things haven't changed much since then. 
And I will leave you with this obscure looking picture of Catawba. We're not used, that's the way the photographer took it. But uh, this is 2011 and pretty much as we know it now. Does anyone have any questions in particular? You had one point of interest, it's not close to Catawba being an island up, but uh, at the Marblehead Lighthouse, there's an old nautical chart uh, in the uh, museum there. And on there is a proposed dam line running from Bay Point to Cedar Point. I, w I would imagine so. They were proposed a dam across uh, Sandusky Bay at one time. Because well, cause the Bay Point and Cedar Point come so close. And th they technically are connected under the water. It's just... Yeah, you run aground every time you run. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions? Oh, yes, sir. Do you, in your research, did you ever find out how Catawba Island was named? And when was it named an island? Uh, it was named after the grape. No, but I mean, it was not Catawba Peninsula. It was named Catawba Island, not Catawba Well, I, I'm assuming, because that was about the mid-1800s, yeah. 1860, somewhere in that area, uh, because it was considered an island. And as those, like that 1863 map illustrated, it was completely surrounded by... Uh, by water, and they may have recognized it geologically, excluding Sand Road, they may have recognized it as an island too. I just know it was named after a grape. I don't know exactly why it was named Island. So I can't completely answer that question. Where is Catawba Island on that particular slide? Or this one right here? Yeah. This right here. Yeah. This, this is the cliffs. Uh, Miller. Miller Dock, there's Mouse Island. The harbor, West Harbor, runs down through, down through there. That's, that's Sandusky Bay back there. But I, it's just an odd perspective, so I figured I'd leave people with that one. Thank you. Before everyone leaves, Got Say, hi, Mom. Oh, <laughs> Thank you all for coming. I hope you enjoyed and you learned some things tonight. Thank you very much.